Chapter 9. Marching the Army Master Sun said, In the placement of one's army and in the scrutiny of the enemy, the following ordinarily apply. In cutting through the mountains, stick to the valleys. Place the army on a height looking toward the sun. When battling at elevation, do not advance upwards towards the enemy. These are rules for the placement of an army in the mountains. Before crossing a river, the army must be placed at a distance from the water. When the enemy is crossing a river toward you, do not meet him in the water. Let half the enemy forces get across and then strike. For this will be to your advantage. If you wish to do battle with the enemy, do not meet him close to the water. Place the army on a height looking towards the sun and do not advance upstream towards the enemy. These are the rules for the placement of an army near water. When cutting across the marshes and the swamps, it is essential to get out of them quickly and to not linger. If you want to join battle with the enemy army in swamps and marshes, you must stick to the grasses and keep your back to the woods. These are the rules for the placement of an army in swamps and marshes. In the plains, place the army on level ground, but with its rear against the higher ground above it. The lowlands in front and the uplands behind. These are the rules for the placement of an army in the plains. The advantages of these four types of placement of an army are such that the Yellow Emperor used them to vanquish the four emperors. An army ordinarily likes heights, but despises depths. They value brightness and disparage darkness. It nourishes itself on vitality and places itself on solidity. Thus it will not fall prey to a host of ailments, and may be declared invincible. When setting up defensive earthworks on hills and ridges, the general must place his army on the sunny side, with its rear against the higher ground above it. These military advantages are support that is derived from the terrain. When there is rain upstream and frothy waters reach you, if you wish to have the army ford the river, you should wait until the flood has abated. Wherever the terrain takes the following forms, you must leave as quickly as possible and do not get near them. Cleft ravine, sky wall, sky corral, sky net, sky sink, sky crevice. I distance myself from these forms and let the enemy get near them. I face these forms and let my enemy have his back next to them. When marching one's army, where there are precipices and obstacles, reed-filled depressions, and mountain forests with dense foliage, you must thread your way through them with the utmost caution, for these are places where ambushes and snipers are found. When the enemy is nearby but remains still, it is because he is relying on strategic location. When he is far off but tries to incite me into battle, it is because he wants me to advance. If he chooses to occupy a place that is easily accessible, it must be because he finds some advantage there. When the multitude of trees begin to move, the enemy is coming. When there are many screens among the multitude of grasses, the enemy is trying to sow doubt. When birds fly up, there is an ambush. When animals run away frightened, the enemy intends to overwhelm me. When dust rises sharply upwards, chariots are coming. When it hangs low and spreads out broadly, foot soldiers are coming. When it is long and wispy, the enemy is gathering firewood. When it is small and sporadic, the enemy is searching for a place to set up camp. When the enemy's envoys employ obsequious language, his preparations are intensifying, and he is getting ready to advance. When the enemy's language is aggressive and he makes a show of rushing forward, he is getting ready to retreat. When the enemy's light chariots appear first and occupy the sides, he will have his troops go into formation. When he sues for peace without any prior agreement, he is scheming. When he races forward with his soldiers and chariots fully deployed, he seeks to engage in battle with me. When he partially advances and partially retreats, he is trying to tempt me. If the enemy's soldiers lean on their weapons while standing, they are hungry. If they drink first when filling vessels with water, they are thirsty. If they see advantage but do not advance toward it, they are weary. If birds flock to the enemy camp, that means it is empty. If the enemy soldiers call out into the night, it means they are terrified. If there is turmoil in the enemy camp, the commander is insufficiently stern. If their flags and banners are moving, there is chaos. If the officers are irritable, they are tired. If they feed the horses grain and eat the flesh of their animals, the army has taken down the cooking pots from their hooks and will not return to camp. They are in desperate straits. If the enemy soldiers cluster together and talk to each other slowly and earnestly in low voices, it means the general has lost their trust. If the enemy is profligate in handing out rewards, it means that he is in extremity. If he is overly harsh with his punishments, it means he is in straitened circumstances. If their general first treats his men cruelly and then later fears them, he is utterly lacking in perspicacity. If enemy envoys come under a pretext to seek terms, it means they want to cease hostilities. If the enemy forces angrily advance and confront us but wait long without engaging in battle, I must cautiously examine their aims.
War is not a matter of the more troops the better. So long as one does not advance rashly, concentrates his strength, and understands his enemy, that will suffice to take the foe. But if one is not circumspect and treats the enemy lightly, he will surely be captured by his foe. If one punishes his troops before he has gained their fealty, they will not submit to him. And if they do not submit, it will be difficult to use them in battle. If one has already gained the fealty of the troops but does not carry out appropriate punishments, he cannot use them in battle either. Therefore, I cultivate my soldiers with civility, and treat them even-handedly according to their military regulations. Hence, I will always be sure to achieve my goal. If all along I can assure myself that the orders are carried out so that my men are properly instructed, then my men will submit. If I cannot ensure that my orders are carried out so that my men are properly instructed, then my men will not submit. The reason I can ensure that my orders are carried out all along is that there is mutual trust between me and my multitudes. End of chapter 9.